My name's Mo Jana. I'm a... I wear a lot of hats. Very, yeah, lots of hats. I'm, I'm glad you got the philanthropy word in. Um, um, I'm a presenter. Um, I'm a producer, so I develop long-form documentaries for broadcast. I'm newly, I'm a, a new author as well. Ooh, done all right. Done all right there for someone who didn't finish school with GCSEs. It's, uh, yes, yes, uh, quite some achievements. And, um, and I am a life coach. And um, I would say, like, someone who's invested in community and communities. Um, and I have been so for a long time. And it was amazing to see so, so many familiar faces. I remember Norbe from back in the day, and Angela Gorman, oh God, the Safe Foundation. Yeah, so it's with Zainab as well, so it's, um, it's good to be back on old terrain. Um, I've been gone a few years in the land of TV, but uh, um, yeah, it's good to uh, synchronize the two worlds and stuff, because it's still a big part of me. So I'm gonna share a little bit about my, um, I'm gonna try and pack in my life into 20 minutes. Give it a good go. Um, and yeah, so my name's, as I said, Mo Jana. Um, I grew up uh, with my parents. I actually was born in South London, Brixton. I was one of eight. Quite impressive, yeah, 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 yeah. My parents, my dad was an academic, uh, and my mum was a stay-at-home mum, as you can imagine, with eight kids. She, she had a lot to do, you know? So it was hard to squeeze out uh, work. But she, she did that sometimes as well, actually. So it was quite a traditional household, very strict household. Um, I actually had a library in my house. Um, and it's funny, living in the area that I lived, it was like, it probably wasn't the coolest thing to go around and say, yeah, I've got a library in my house. And uh, so I kept that still. But now I'm an adult, I can, I can say it, yeah, you know, with pride as well. So it's, um, so having a very, very strict household and my family hail from Northwest Africa. So from Mali, Sierra Leone, Mauritania, uh, Guinea, Conakry, that type of region, um, and um, and more regions actually. We did our um, our DNA recently, so we've got South Africa, we've got Sudan, I've got um, Spain. Anyway, there's all sorts going on. But um, so yeah, so they were. It was it was an African household, um, and in every sense of the word, and so that was uh, a very um, it was very much focused on education. Education was really, really massive. Um, and I wasn't a traditional um, individual. My, I, was, I had a solid IQ level, I would say. I could say that now. Uh, but I think that my forte was EQ, so emotional intelligence. Now, in an African household, or in most households, EQ doesn't run because, um, you know, for a young, inquiring soul in a very strict household, uh, it just, it just, you know, it was like, shut up, go to your room. And, and I did, uh, most of the time. So I spent a lot of my childhood reading, um, Enid Blyton books. And, um, uh, yes, yes, it was Enid Blyton, yeah, Mallory Towers, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I can, I can own it now, you know, it's all those years I couldn't say a thing, you know, in school, didn't want to ruin my street cred, but there we go. Um, yeah, so books were really something that set my imagination a light from very, very young. And I didn't realize how important words would, would, would come to, and communication would come to, 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 to being a massive part of my life. And um, I suppose when I look back into life, everything that I went through was kind of like training for what was to come, you know? So um, when, I was, when I was between nine, to ages nine, 10, 11, my little world was shaken um, quite a lot. Um, my, my brother, my older brother passed away, sadly. Um, he was a victim of the drugs epidemic that hit the streets of the UK during the 80s and the 90s. Um, my, uh, my auntie died of, of cancer. Um, I remember being about 10 and my dad took me to the hospital and she was in there and she was in the bed and she looked nothing like she, you know, a healthy version of herself. And she, you know, I was looking at my dad thinking, why did you bring me here? What am I doing here? And she called me in. She was like, come here. And I was like, no. And she told me to look after my dad. And I was just horrified by the whole experience and stuff. So it really, really stayed with me. And um, during that period of time, which is, you know, really crucial times, 9, 10, 11, I had a few more deaths as well. My classmate, Dorothy, sadly passed away from leukemia 
which again, to understand, to be a little person and to realize little people die too, was quite a, uh, quite a thing. And, um, and to top it off, actually, just before we, I left uh, primary school for secondary school, uh, one of our favorite teachers, uh, Mrs. Salter, um, she, we all loved her. She was really, really one of the great teachers. You always remember them. And um, she was going to go and travel the world. And they, we had a big assembly, and we were crying and all that type of stuff. And literally the following week, we had an additional assembly, and they said that um, she had had an allergic reaction to, I think, nuts, and she died. You know, and um, again, you know, a young man going into secondary school. I was like, what the hell is going on? You know, world, the world is not that nice um, in that respect. So um, that's the context that I was kind of, I grew up in. We've got a very, very close family. I think family is very, very important um, in, in my life. And, and, um, and so that was also uh, something also I think I should say. So just, just um, after secondary school, we moved from Birmingham, uh, from Birmingham, from um, London to Birmingham. My parents kind of separated. I think the trauma of going through the so many deaths, like my brother. I didn't also say my during that period, my mum's uh, dad, father passed away as well. Um, and I think the strain of that kind of like pushed them apart um, somewhat. So my mum, bless her, she's a powerful woman. She's a very strong woman. African women are, oh, God, yeah, anyway. There's a few African women in here, I'm sure the men will agree. Anyway, uh, <laughs> anyway, I don't want to get in trouble. I'll continue. So uh, we moved cities to Birmingham, and um, for a break, I think a new start, and um, I was lucky enough to go to, or lucky enough to go to a, 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 a quite a good school. It was a grammar school. I'd gone to a grammar school. I was quite pleased. All those... Um, Nights reading Mallory Towers paid off, uh, clearly, because when I went in there, and they were like, hi, Mo. I'm like, hi. It was very much like what I'd read, so it was bloody great. Um, no, no, really, really, very much so. So uh, I was living my best life for a few years uh, until, um, sadly, what I would say is, like, there was a lot of mental health going on um, in my household and um, undiagnosed, because when you grow up, it's what you're, not, what you're used to as well. But um, being the spirited person that I was, um, quite a deep person, I think. I was naturally always quite deep and stuff. I internalized it, a lot of it, and any time, any opportunity to go out to school or to see a friend and stuff, it was my time, you know, I became me type of thing. Whereas in your house, it's very, it's great, you have to conform. So I kind of grew up in that conformist uh, environment with my soul and spirit just waiting to get through the window. Uh, and it did, we'll get there. So, um, Going through school, school was a, a good time, love-hate relationship. It was a... I didn't see colour in school or growing up, actually. It wasn't really that um, type of environment. Even in my school where I was like probably one of like two or three black guys, it just wasn't a thing. Um, and I was very, very social. That was probably my, my number one thing. I was very... Um, uh, I liked people. That was my, you know, I didn't... I, I'd come to know that was probably be one of my big things. And um, it was a, so it was a very, very beautiful experience. One which was, uh, you know, uh, allowed me to just make great friends and, um, and build really strong connections with people. Sadly, that didn't last. Um, I was uh, kicked out of that school. Um, kicked out sounds harsh. I was expelled uh, for a, a fight. It was a very, very strict school, so it's... Um, yeah, it was, uh, I'm still traumatized by it, actually, to be honest. Um, but it was a really, really traumatized period because, you know, for a family who they love education, my brother's a civil instructor engineer, my dad's an academic, we've got um, environmental scientists, we've got architects, we've got teachers, and then there's me. So, yeah, it was, it was hard for everybody to take and stuff. So, as opposed to going to school, I was, like, trapped in at home with my mum. Oh, God, yeah, and my little sister. So... It was, it was a really, really tough period. I really think I, I suffered from depression quite young. I think kind of knowing that home life wasn't right, quite right, and, um, and also being rejected from school. When you're young, you just want to fit in with a crowd. You know, you just want to be part of, like, just let me in, you know. And um, so then to be ostracized or to, 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 to be um, uh, rejected from a, from a school from, and also to move areas, so I'm from London, I'm in Birmingham, right? And everyone talks like that. And I'm, so I was a little bit perplexed. And um, 
I was troubled and vulnerable. I was a really, really vulnerable young person. So I, spent, I think I spent um, the next um, eight months or so in the house. It was funny, I tried to go, there's like a, like, I think there's like a naughty school that you can go if you're kicked out of school. And uh, my mum didn't let me go. She said, you will not go there. I'm like, please, I want to play with people my age. And yeah, she just didn't have it. And, and I think, you know, we're all, I've come to know we're all social characters. And we're all, we're all interconnected. We're all created to, 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 to engage. And so to actually not have that outlay and to be a really, really social individual, um, it was a really tough time, you know, a really, really tough time. And I think the issues with my mother and my father um, may have been bubbling under the surface as well. So um, so after that little period, I, I kind of floated in the wilderness for a little while, actually. <clears throat> I must try and stay still. Um, I kind of floated in, in the wilderness for a little while. I think I joined the local college. Um, again, I think... You know, for me, I just wanted to fit in. I just wanted to find a crowd, have some fun. Um, you know, of course I had a childhood, um, but I always felt I missed out because we didn't have what everybody else had in some instances, with all the toys and stuff. So just me and me books. And um, and I did have some toys. You're looking at me with sad eyes. I was, you know, um, but yeah, it, I, I always felt like uh, there was something I was missing out on. So I went to, went to college. Um, and in college, um, being a young person in a new city, I was, um, and also having a particular character which allowed, I suppose, me to get on with people and people to get on with me, um, I was quite quickly taken under the wings by maybe some of the not so good people. Um, but again, my fascination with people and wanting to be accepted, um, I was in for the ride. I was like, take me, I'm coming, you know, and, um, Unfortunately, at the time, it's funny when you think back now, I feel like, you know, I'm quite a strong man. And to, to think that you were, to think back and to think about a younger me and think about me being groomed, um, which was quite sad. It was something that I had to, in my early 20s, I, was, I had to come to terms with. Um, and, uh, you know, and obviously there's a reason for being groomed um, um, by, you know, yeah, it's just the dynamics that happens. It can happen in any environment. And I suppose by me being around other people who maybe didn't have my best interests at heart or didn't even know what their best interests were wasn't a good thing. But again, young and dumb and um, full of happiness and joy, um, I kind of went with it. This period concluded, concluded in me um, being sent to a young person's institute for 18 months. I did nine months, which was an amazing wake-up call. Um, you know, it, it, it was quite a surreal experience because I always, I suppose at the, there was something within me that always felt I had something to give. I had something um, to give. So to, and obviously from the family that I'm from, I was like the only one to go anywhere like that. So it was, it felt like I wasn't, it wasn't a good fit, you know. Um, but when I went into into that environment, on what I came to know and realize, again, being a person, a uh, people's person, I realized that, um, one, it gave me a real, it, it humbled me. Because I feel like after that point, I never felt I was better than anyone else. So always it was like, no, you've been in like some really low places. Um, and, and also I feel like the proximity you get with being with all different types of people. So, you know, I work now in the world of stories and people, people and stories. So actually that intimacy that I had with individuals who had got into situations partly by their circumstances. So, you know, some things are nature, some things are nurture. And, and I think in that environment, it really came home to roost. So I had a lot of time to think. And, um, and I made some great friends. Oh, there's me with the social thing again. Um, and I really, really did because I got an opportunity to, to think as well on myself and not to be, um, I suppose, you know, of course you're influenced by your environment, but I suppose, you know, there's a hell of a lot of thinking time to yourself. Um, and I realized I didn't know who I was. So I spent so many of my years either trying to conform to how somebody wanted me to be 
or I spent so many years trying to just fit in, so doing what other people wanted me to do because I thought it looked cool maybe or they'd like me more or whatever it was. So I feel like things really came home to roost. And another thing, maybe because um, of being impacted by like deaths so early, I had like, I think I was scared that like my parents would die or something, well, like, you know. So I think that was, they were some of the things that really impressioned on a young version of me. And, you know, for me, when I look back at my character um, or look back at my younger me, I realized I feel like I needed to be, I needed to be pressed by life. <laughs> you know, you, were, well, you needed to go to prison. No, I didn't. But I just needed to be pressed because um, under pressure makes diamonds. And I felt like I had a natural, um, I was very jovial, I'm very fun. Sometimes, you know, I can be very fun and, and all that type of thing. So I needed a, I needed to be sobered. I needed some sobriety, literally. And I felt like those that those experiences and spending time with people who were worse off than me. You know, I used to, you know, I spent all my time in there. Again, my passion for reading, reading, you know, and people would come, what, you're reading? I'm like, yes, I'm reading. You can't read. Go, you know, that type, you know. It, but it was, a, I, it was an alien thing to people in that environment. And so understanding that I had something that actually people in that environment necessarily didn't, not necessarily didn't have. And I seen that as maybe I had something to give. So anyway, um, when I got out of there, I was packed up very, very quickly down to, um, by my parents, um, down to Wales. They were like, go down there, you've got family down there, you stay down there, um, which was a really, really good idea. Because I feel like sometimes you just need a fresh, slate you know you need a fresh a clean slate and i suppose wales also offered me um a family that i had down here and obviously and i've and and i've also gained a, a much bigger family um and it gave me the space to to, to be myself <laughs> but that was um without without the pressures of the environment and whatever i'd built up whatever which was linked to my ego and stuff like that so um it was a wonderful experience. Um, and, you know, just to go back as well, um, my family, just to give a little bit more context, my family's been there since the 1940s. So since the early Wimrush, in fact, a little bit before that period. So they're quite an old family. And they came um, via um, the Docklands, or more kind of Liverpool way, Cardiff. And then they kind of moved off into like Manchester ways in that region. So um, we, ha I've always had a connection with Wales. I used to come up here when I was younger, on holiday and stuff. Um, I was a little, always a, a fairy tale experience coming from um, the bricks and mortar of London <laughs> over to the green, serene um, land of Wales. So it was really, really beautiful. So I always had, I feel like, a inner connection. And um, so, yeah, so on to my uh, Welsh chapter. I know time is ticking. I try and... Um, I try and um, uh, begin my journey. So let's say my professional journey, um, after a lot of soul searching, after a lot of reflections um, caused by situations that happened to my life, in my life, whether it be my family situations, mental health situations that impacted my family, um, uh, from prison, going to prison, um, and then and then obviously moving cities and stuff. So I, um, so yeah, there was a, a, a lot going on. So professionally, I realized that there was more to give I think everybody's different. I have, um, maybe I had an inner confidence in me that I felt that there was, I had to extend myself. And I also had an element of redemption. I was probably quite embarrassed by what had happened previously. So I felt that helping people made me feel good. And it was actually something that I was really, really good at. Um, during this period where I came down to Wales and I started to volunteer at the Red Cross, um, uh, drugs clinics, um, uh, uh, um, youth clubs, you know, I would um, did a whole lot of volunteering in order to try and actually find myself. And when I say find myself, it was to find who I, what I was good at. What do I like? What would I pass on? Um, and that type of thing. So I felt like the... I, I basically ch um, changed the way that I looked at life. Um, over time, nothing comes um, so easily. But in time, I was able to, and I was committed to providing a service, a service, 
um, to the society around me. Um, initially, that started with um, uh, the railways, jumps on the railways. Uh, that was an interesting experience if you want to work with lots of men farting in a van. Um, uh, it was a good experience as well. Again, I'm, a, I'm quite a social person, so that was a good experience. I left there, I realized I did uh, my first kind of professional qualification, which was um, occupational health and safety management. Um, which was an amazing experience as well, because when I went on did that, I had, there was doctors, engineers, everybody in there, and they see me for what I was. They didn't see me for, um, with any labels or anything like that. And I'd, and you know, I'd say something sometimes and they'd say, oh, that's interesting. That's a good point, Mo. And I was like, is it really? You know, so it's almost like affirmation, because affirmation is a really important thing on your journey to success. You need people to, I certainly need the people to say, well done, Mo. That was good. You know, and that type of thing. So again, I, I suppose it's part of that journey of trying to be accepted, you know, as part of that thing. So, um, I went into the working world, in the world of occupational health and safety management, which is good. I got my first office job, um, which was great, and it was good. My first um, office job had a community focus to it. There was a community regeneration element to it. Um, I realized that I really did like preservation of life. Um, which, which is health and safety, but it was the intimacy, the interaction with people that um, was, was more my strength. I went on to do, um, over the next 10 years, 12 years, show me age, I'm older than I look, um, I went on to work in a whole range of fields, tapping into my experience and the things that I've been through. Um, so I worked in, uh, in the valleys, um, the, the regional quality council supporting young people on, and people so in general into um, into education further training I uh, worked for the serious crime unit later later down the line I worked in the prisons as a teacher mental health programs and it was, it was absolutely great and what I realized was I'd actually used all my experiences and all the things that I was good at to create to create a world for me to create um, an income for me and um, and to make right i 'm speedily along and um, that was a fantastic experience and another thing to, to 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 add at that moment was I also felt that I was living i 'd been given a new lease of life, so I would be extraordinary so i 'd work a nine to five and then I, from quarter past five to about one o 'clock midnight i 'd be doing other things so i 'd work with college Gwent. Um, absolutely fantastic and I'd put on um, educational programs across um, Cardiff, Newport, the Valleys. Um, I would work with, I'd do a little bit of international development so we'd work with schools and colleges to get their surplus um, equipment and we'd ship it in containers to different countries like Sierra Leone and Ghana, um, Bangladesh as well. Um, I would I ended up doing a lot of one-to-ones with people because um, I had empathy and compassion. Life had created that empathy and passion, and I suppose maybe I had it within me anyway. Um, so I'd be doing lots of interventions with families. There was lots of... Um, I started working for the social workers, and I started working with social work, and my, social, my colleagues were like, Mo, can you handle this? And the demand was like so fierce, um, not only from the clients um, and, and that engagement, but also from my staff members. So it was this kind of extraordinary life um, that kind of got me onto, onto the TV in a weird way. Um, during this period, or the end of this period, I, I bought an ambulance. Don't ask me why. Nobody sent me to a salvage. I put my hand up, and anyway, anyway it all happened. So um, I was literally driving around South Wales, helping people in all manner of, of, of ways. Um, and um, a, a, a guy... A gentleman, uh, Martin Reed. Uh, oh God, they're creeping up. Right, okay, I'll try and I'll try and speed up. So uh, a, a guy, a gentleman, um, seen what I was doing at the time. Again, life's about affirmations. He was like, "Look, can I film what you're doing?" I think at the time I was handing out. I had a massive stock of of homeless stuff. Um, so uh, I had blankets. Uh, gloves, woolly hats and stuff that I'd acquired from a charity because they weren't doing anything with it. And I was like, can I have them? And they were like, yeah, there you go. They wanted to clear a cupboard and I wanted to give some stuff. So I was handing out stuff in town in the middle of the night. Um, and he came and he filmed me doing that. Um, I was like, what are you doing? And he was like, just keep doing what you're doing. And, um, and then um, I had a guy who was the head of Warner Brothers come down he come met with me. I'm like, who are you? He was like, I'm so-and-so. He's like, what do you want to do? Do you want to work on TV? I'm like, 
what is this? What's going on? It's all quite a surreal experience and stuff. They're like, what do you like doing? I like, I like people. They're like, okay, um, what aspect of people? I said, I like everything. And they're like, oh, for crying out loud. Anyway, so I got into the career. Um, I did my first show, which is called Moles World, which came out in 2018, I believe, which was just me helping people and stuff. Once I did that experience, I realized that TV was all about people and people's stories. I realized that I was... I was immersed in people's stories because I'd spent so much time with people, helping people, trying to connect to people, trying to just listen, for instance. And, um, and I'd taken that wealth with me, and, and that was an asset in itself. So when I got into the industry, I realized very, very soon that they wanted to pigeonhole you, like, okay, then you work on news or you work on this and that. I'm like, no, I want everything. And so I started to develop ideas. Um, at that time, I didn't realize I was very, very creative in terms of ideas. Um, I'd later be called an ideas man, ideas machine, a freak. So, um, and my ideas, like creativity, held no bounds. So I'd create sports ideas, I'd make uh, current affairs ideas, I'd create um, uh, uh, social history documentaries, a whole raft of stuff. Um, and I threw everything at it. And so in a space of like, I don't know, five years or so, um, I was able to work on a lot of project, projects and get a massive overview of, of the industry. I'm going to try and wrap it up very, very soon. Where am I now? Um, so I went from 30-minute documentaries to creating series, docs. Um, I'm uh, any one time I'm working on many documentaries, series. I'm working on, on Global Wales, uh, which looks at Wales between the period of 80, 18, 8, 1870 and 1921, when, when the Welsh population went from under half a million to over two and a half million. What was going on? Who came? What was the movement? That's one of the projects that I'm working on. Um, uh, I work, I'm working on a big uh, um, uh, Welsh athletics documentary, which looks at the 90s period, which was our most successful period in, in of Welsh athletics, with Colin Colin uh, Jackson, um, Jamie Bolsh, Ewan Thomas, and that type of those types of individuals. So really trying to celebrate those individuals. And what I would say as well, the same spirit of line of life coaching, empathy, and all that type of great stuff, I brought with me to the TV world. So I'm doing exactly the same thing. I'm just championing people, but in a different way. And I suppose it's a more effective way because life coaching is very tiring on a one-to-one -one basis. So this way you can create something that can impact a lot of people. And so that's kind of my mission. And I do that in lots of different very unique ways. Uh, I'm going to wrap it up now. It's fantastic to be um, a part of this. Um, I'm a very proud British man, Welsh man, an African man. They are a part, all parts of me that have shaped me. I feel it's a duty for me to impact those aspects of me. And I've kind of dedicated my life to that. And I will con to continue to do so. It's fantastic to see so many familiar faces as well. Thank you for listening to me.